Okay, hi everybody, welcome back. So, hope you had a nice weekend. Let me try to remind you what we did last time. By the way, any questions? Any questions on the previous material or midterm or homeworks? Uh, can you say it again? The day of meeting. Oh, what meeting? Like uh, the midterm. Uh, it's May seventh, I think. Yeah, I. It should be the Friday of next week, which I think is May seventh. Any other questions? Okay, so let me remind you, last time I was talking about partitions and their generated functions, and for that I needed infinite products and infinite sums. So if you have an infinite sum of formal power series, then it stabilizes, so it has a sort of term-wise limit Right, so stabilizes means that it's a stupid kind of limit. So uh, each term becomes constant after finitely many steps. Each coefficient. So it stabilizes if and only if the minimal degree, uh, minimal degree of this f sub j of x tends to infinity as j goes to infinity. And similarly, if you have an infinite product of 1 plus g sub j of x, then that stabilizes if and only if the same condition uh, holds for g sub j of x. So in this case, these have limit as formal power series. So we can talk about, yeah, what we need to check is these conditions on the minimal degrees. And for, for example, uh, last time I computed that if you take the, generated, the ordinary generated function for partitions, then it's given by this beautiful product, infinite product formula for j from one up to infinity of one minus next to the j. So you can check that each of these each of these individual terms is of this form. Right. So uh, and the bijection was basically you just look at each term just gives you uh, each term is like 1 plus x to the j plus x to the 2j plus x to the 3j plus etc. So to get uh, a partition of n, you just out of each term you pick the number of parts equal to j. So and today I want to start by talking about the variations of this approach. So uh, today I'm gonna yes. So today I'm gonna consider partitions into distinct, distinct parts, and odd parts, because that's what we looked at previously. So, uh, any questions so far? By the way, please feel free to turn on your video or thanks to those who already did. Uh, all right, so how do I... Maybe I should just ask a question. How do I... Maybe you can tell me. How do I do odd parts and how do I do distinct parts? Okay. Indeed, uh, so, uh, yeah, that's correct, thank you. So if you take the sum 
uh, the generated function for partitions into distinct parts, which will be denoted by p sub d of n, then all you have to do is you take the same product, but instead of, so here, arbitrary multiplicity is allowed, if I just remove all these extra terms and only take 1 plus x to the j, 1 plus x to the j, then I will get only partitions where each part has multiplicity at most 1. So what about uh, odd parts? Some p and odd parts is what? Uh, no, no, each part. Right, so each each part is odd. Yeah, sorry. I, I think I previously denoted. Uh, yeah, I think I previously denoted this by uh, by the same symbol. I denoted a different different object. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, right, so this is just a simple, right, I, I just forbid the even parts. For even parts, I force the multiplicity to be just zero. Product j from 1 up to infinity of 1 over 1 minus x to the 2j minus 1. Okay, uh, yeah, so th that's true. And so proof, uh, and proof is, it, it just follows by by inspection. Uh, very similar to the proof I did proof I did last time. And so now now somebody should ask a, a very nice question. Now is the time for a nice question. So does anybody have a question related to some other statements we need we learned about odd about odd parts and distinct parts. Yeah, great, thank you. They, these, these numbers are actually the same, right? We, so we previously, previously I showed bijectively that the, the number of partitions into distinct parts is equal to the number of partitions into odd parts. bijectively. There was a complicated bijection with the binary expansion of each multiplicity. But then, on the other hand, it appears that I have the right-hand sides look different. Right? So, but, but the generating function should be the same. So, uh, so that's kind of surprising. Mm -hmm. So let me try to explain that. So let me give you another proof. I guess that's a corollary. Uh, the corollary I claim is that indeed, indeed, the number of partitions into distinct parts is equal to the number of partitions into odd parts for all n. And but now I'm going to give you a proof not using bijections, but using generating functions. Uh, which, okay, so what are the two functions that I need to compare? Uh, 
So, uh, all right, let's see. So the first idea is to say that one plus x to the j, one plus x to the j can be written as one minus x to the two j over one minus x to the j. That is, that is some elementary algebra. And therefore, the left hand side, this generated function here is equal to, well, let me write it down. So uh, the product over j from one up to infinity, one plus x to the j can be written as one minus x squared over one minus x times one minus x to the fourth over one minus x squared times one minus x to the sixth over one minus x cubed. Okay, so which, yeah, it's some infinite product, which, uh, so, and now I'm, what I'm gonna do is a nice little trick. So I'm gonna just cancel out all, I'm gonna cancel out all even terms. One minus x to the fourth. So each, for each even, for each even j, my one minus x to the j appears in the numerator and in the denominator exactly once. And it may look tricky because uh, I'm kind of doing an infinite product and then infinite constellation, but you can, it is kind of straightforward to check that this is actually a, a valid operation on formal power series. So if, I, if I'm only interested in like finite, you know, the coefficient of x to some m, then I only need to, to consider finitely many terms and indeed I'm gonna see that all the needed constellations occur. Yeah, so, and after I have done all the constellations, all I'm gonna get is the odd, is the odd denominators. So this is equal to one over one minus x times one over one minus x cubed times one over one minus x to the fifth, etc., which is the same as the right hand side just the product over all odd parts. So yeah, this is slightly, looks slightly non-rigorous, but I think it's beautiful. It's beautiful argument, which is actually uh, very old, right? So it, it, this whole thing is due to Euler in 1748. So this is, uh, there was no rigorous analysis, no epsilon, delta, Cauchy, theorems, none of that. So he was just kind of, he was very good at manipulating infinite series non-rigorously, but he knew when, when like it's wrong and when it's right. So he had a very nice intuition and most of his proofs can actually be converted into a rigorous argument. Like for example, here you can, after some work, you can make sense of this infinite constellation in terms of formal power series. Does it make sense? Any, any questions on this? Are distinct parts also equal to even part? Uh, that's actually, I think that's not true. So for, uh, so let's say n is equal to two, and then distinct parts are gonna be well, okay, maybe n equals to three. Distinct parts are, I can take three is equal to two plus one or equal to three. So there's two partitions into distinct parts, but then uh, partitions into even parts, there of n is zero because n is odd. If n is odd, you can't, you can't partition it into even parts of even size. For n even, oh, okay, so you want me to try n equals to four. Let me try n equals to four. And then if I want distinct parts, four is three plus one. Oh. I think maybe for even you just, you just divide everything by two. I think that would, 
No, but that's not, no, hold on. Why is that? Hmm. Should we try and close to six? Six is five plus one, uh, four plus two, three plus two plus one. So pd of n is four. And if I want to partition it into even parts, now I get six is equal to four plus two, and that's it, right? There is no more, or two plus two plus two. Okay, so this is one is four, and another one is three. So not equal. Or am I? Is this is this good or am I missing something? Missing six. Wait, where? Uh, so six, four plus two, and two plus two plus two. Good. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's a good conjecture. But uh, yeah, so. And this is one of the first sort of, well, not not the first, but it's a nice corollary. Proving this bijectively is pretty hard. I did it in class, but it's kind of tricky. On the other hand, you can manipulate, you can, like the, the, the only complicated step is to represent 1 plus x to the j as this ratio, which, yeah, anyways, this whole, proving this using generated functions involves only very simple high school level manipulations, although with infinite infinite series like this. Um, yeah, anyway, so let me, let me know. That's basically, so that's it for done with ordinary generated functions. From now on, I'm gonna uh, explain a bunch of formulas for exponential generated functions, and then, and then we're gonna sw switch to something else, because I mean, it's, it's good to just develop the theory, but we also want to count other interesting things. So yeah, now let me switch to, yeah, I'm going to start with the product, with the product formula for exponential generating functions. And uh, yeah, so by the way, let me uh, briefly mention that notation-wise, Notation, what I previously previously denoted f sub n, from now, uh, now I'm going to denote f of n, because it's going to be easier. Uh, it's, just, it's just a very minor measure of notation, but it's going to be, because I'm going to put stuff down here anyways. f of n denotes f sub n, but the same thing. Yeah, and so what is the what is the product formula for exponential generated functions? If you have, that's uh, what we discussed in the first lecture. X to the n over n factorial times the same product for g of n is equal to the sum uh, n greater than zero h of n x to the n over n factorial where h of n is uh, what it's, it's basically you multiply them as polynomials, but you insert an extra binomial coefficient in front. So yeah, what, I, what I'd like to start with is to give a combinatorial interpretation. So I want F of, I want to imagine that f of n counts some objects and g of n counts some other objects. Then I want to tell you what kinds of objects are counted by h of n. And so, so here's the idea. Let's say you. Let's say that f of n. Yeah, I'm going to use the term tasks, even though that's sort of slightly non-rigorous. So suppose. Suppose that f of n counts the number of ways to perform some task on the set on bracket n. On bracket n. And let's say, uh, 
Let's say the same is true for g of m. g of n counts number of ways to perform some other task. Some other task task on the on the set bracket n. And then what I claim is that uh, here is an interpretation for h of n. Let h of n count number of ways to split. So the first step is to split bracket n as a disjoint union of two sets. As a disjoint union of two sets in any way. So the sets could, each of them could be empty and the order matters. Uh, and then perform the first task on S and perform the second task on T. Right, so maybe you want to take a bunch of players, split them into two teams, and then do something to one team and something else to the other, like pick a captain or whatever. Uh, that would be an example of such a, such an, such a counting function. Yeah. So if this is true, then the exponential generating functions satisfy for f, uh, for f, g, and h. They, they satisfy the product formula. h of x is equal to f of x times g of x. So here, h of x is, is just the sum, is just the exponential generated function of h of n. So just as in this formula here, and what I'm saying is just sort of a restatement of this product formula here. If you, if you look at the product formula, this binomial coefficient mean is the number of choices for S, for this disjoint union S and, and T, right? So there's N choose I, if S is of size I, then there's N choose I options for S, and then you perform the first task on S and the second task on T. Then you sum over all possible sizes of S. So let me actually, let me rewrite H. Uh, so this whole long sentence can be rewritten as follows. In other words, if I, I just define H of N to be the sum over all ways to split bracket N into a disjoint union of S and T, that's why sum over all pairs s comma t of f of the cardinality of s times g of the cardinality of t. So that's a concise way to write down this whole this whole sentence. And it's very easy to see that this this expression here is the same as this expression here. So I'm not doing anything kind of deep. I'm just giving you a combinatorial interpretation. Because later I'm going to do the same for some more complicated formulas. So I want you to kind of get used to this, this sort of notation. Yeah. So I'm going to give you an example. But before that, any, any questions? So this is called the product formula. And any questions on the product formula for exponential generated functions. Okay. Let me try to give you an example 
let's see what kind of example I have here. Right, okay, so let's say you want to count at h of n denote the number of ways to split. So this is sort of a boring example, but just to split n into disjoint union s square cup t, and then you want to linearly order elements of s, and you want to choose choose an arbitrary subset of t. Okay, so that's that's like a weird thing you want to do. You want, uh, you want to linear order one set and to choose some subset of the other. This is kind of mostly I want just want to demonstrate what kind of arbitrary things you can count using generating functions. So and the question is here I'm not I don't even want the generating function I want to actually find h of n or maybe or maybe I want to find the generating function. Yeah, this yeah let, let's for this one let's say. Uh, I want to find the exponential generating function of h of n. So, what do you mean linearly order? Well, uh, kind of. You want to assign. You want to assign numbers. Uh, okay, so linear order. This just means choose a permutation of the elements of S. So there is like a factorial number of ways to do that. Does make sense? Or? Okay. So yeah, so how do I do this? Well, I use the product formula. Use the product formula. What are so I need to choose f of n and g of n. Let's say f of n is the number of ways to linearly order, right? So number of permutations of brackets n, n factorial. Well, let's say g of n is the number of ways to choose a subset of bracket n. So that is two to the n. If I take the exponential generating function, uh, f of x sum n greater or equal to zero, n factorial times x to the n over n factorial, I get, so the n factorial cancels out, I just get a geometric progression, which is one over one minus x. If I take the exponential generating function, function of two to the n, sum over n greater than or equal to zero, two to the n, x to the n over n factorial. So this is just two x to the n. So what I get is a series for the exponential of two x. Therefore, by the product formula, the answer is so the exponential generating function h of x, which is h of n x to the n over n factorial, is just by definition, well, just by the product formula, is f of x times g of x, which is the exponential of 2x over 1 minus x. Which, yeah, okay, it may or may not be clear what you can do with this exponential training function, but I mean, you can. There is, yeah, we're gonna see later. In, in some ways, in some cases, you can actually find a closed formula for h of n. In this case, I'm not, I'm not sure if we can do that, but anyways, it, it's useful to have a 
you can sometimes you can find the asymptotics of your sequence, even though we're not going to do that. But if you just want to find the exponential giant function, then you can use the product formula in this case. Are we good? Or because the next one is going to be uh, actually yeah, let's do the next one, which is the next one is going to be slightly more interesting. So. Uh, because that, that then okay so here is the more general uh, more general iterated iterated product formula which is I mean you just instead of having two tasks you want to do k different tasks so. Uh, And this is also the, the actual statement is very easy, but the it's it's actually more useful. So suppose you have uh, k different different tasks. So you have uh, suppose you have sequences. Uh, we have sequences f one of n, f two of n. Etc. F sub k of n. And then uh, I want to define h of n to be the number of ways to split your t1 square cup t2, etc. square cup tk is equal to bracket n. There is a typo here, I guess. It's supposed to be equal to bracket n. Uh, and then uh, I want f1 of the number of the size of t1 times f2 of the size of t2, etc. f sub k of the size of t sub k. So in other words, you take your set bracket n, you split it into k different blocks, you perform the first task on the first block, the second task on the second block, and etc. The kth task on the kth block. And the then the exponential generating functions are going to satisfy the product, the generalized product formula. H of x is equal to f of f sub one of x times f sub two of x, etc. Times f sub k of x, where each individual one is the exponential generating function of each individual term. So you can yeah you can prove it just by sort of in the but in the same sort of iterated in the same iter by iterating this argument for, for the usual product formula of two things. I guess yeah, proof exercise and any question on this more general thing? Does it seem useful or useless? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's see. Let's try some example. I think. I think now I'm going to have a good example. Oh, well, it's it's still kind of contri contrived, but whatever. It's it can be a problem on the midterm or something. So uh, I want to find. Now this is a purely combinatorial problem, so no, I want the answer to be an actual number. How many ways uh, are there? So the original problem was about telephone poles, but I'm just gonna because I, I, I want the elements to be distinct. To paint the elements of bracket n into four colors. The colors uh, also, yeah, you can you can use red, green, and blue, and yellow color. I'm just going to denote the colors by A, B, C, and D, so that the conditions are so that uh, there is an odd number of 
elements are colored A, base, and an even number, number of Bs. And no conditions on C and D. So I want to color N things in, N people or whatever into, uh, into four colors such that these conditions are satisfied. So that's the question. And yeah, if you if you are previously we mostly did just combinatorial arguments, if you are used to those, then uh, maybe you can you can try to quickly figure out what the answer is going to be. It's I think it's pretty tricky, but we're going to use generating functions for that. And so let h of n be the answer. So how how do I use the product formula here? What are going to be the what are going to be the tasks? Um, yeah. So what's the what's the setup where I can apply the product formula? Sets that are colored A, B, C, and D are disjoint. Okay, yeah, that, that's a good observation, right? So I need partition into four disjoint sets, right? So indeed, let me try. Let me try to say that H of n is the. Let me even denote T A square cup T B, T C and T D. Right, so these are the sets. Of where I color each ball, then uh, have f a of the size of t a times f sub b of the size of t b times f sub c of the size of t c times f sub d of the size of t d. Okay, yeah, that is, that is good. So what are these uh, what are these f's now? f sub a of x is 1 if x is odd and 0 if x is even. Right? Thank you. So, because there is a condition that the odd number, there should be an odd number of a's. So f sub a of n is 1 if n is odd and 0 if n is even. Similarly, f sub b of n is uh, 0 if n is odd and 1 if n is even. And what are fc and fd of n? Okay, they're just 1. Okay, thank you. Right, so you see even, even if the even if the actual uh, sort of the, these f f i's functions, they are all very simple, you know, just zero and one, or even just all ones, and yet they allow you to solve such a complicated problem. So yeah, by the way, let me try to compute the first before we before we get to the answer. Uh, here I have computed some of the h's. So let me try. Let's say h of one is equal to one. Because if you just have one, uh, you just have one person, then you can only color. Number of a's has to be odd. So the coloring, the coloring, is just you just color. You must color your element a. And h of two is equal to four because the colorings are going to be. Right, so I have two balls or two people, and then I need to color. One of them has to be colored A, and the other one. So the, the possible colorings are A C and A D, C A and D A, because uh, you have to use an even number of Bs and odd number of As. 
So there has to be exactly one A, and then the other one cannot be colored B. So there is four colorings. And then H of three is, um, you have to, I don't, I don't know if you can do it quickly in your head, but let's try generating functions. So what is, uh, we have the setup with the H of N exactly as in the proposition. So uh, by the proposition, I, I need, just need to multiply these exponential generated functions. So what are the exponential generated functions for f sub a, f sub b, f sub c, and f sub d? Let's say, let's start with f sub c, f sub c of x, and f sub d of x. This is just the sum. Uh, of what? x to the n over n factorial. So that's just the exponential of x. Because I'm just taking, yeah, I'm just taking the exponential generated function of the sequence of all ones. Now for f of f sub a of x, I only need to take the odd terms. So it's the sum, n greater equal to zero, x to the two n plus one over two n plus one factorial. Yeah, and how do I? What is? How do I find this generated function? And similarly, let me try d of x. While you're thinking about the odd ones, let me also write down the even ones. x to the 2n times x. Uh, okay, so you're saying I can, I can get the x I can get the x out of the sum. Yeah, so uh, let me, that is also true. So it's, if I recall correctly, e to the x minus e to the negative x over two. Oh yeah, that's actually, yeah, let me try. That is the, that is the correct guess, thank you. So uh, yeah, if you, you just say e to the x minus e to the negative, uh, e to the negative x over two. That's the hyperbolic sign, I guess, right? Because, uh, so why is this true? It's the sum over all n greater or equal to zero, one half of x to the n over n factorial minus negative x to the n over n factorial. And so the even term, the terms for even n are gonna cancel out. The terms for the odd n are gonna you're going to add these add these together and divide by two, so you're going to get exactly exactly all each or term exactly once. And similarly, oh, uh, you wrote plus. Okay, yeah. So for the other one, it's plus e to the x plus e to the negative x over two. If this was a plus, then the odd terms would cancel, and I would only be left with the even terms. So yeah, so now uh, that's the answer, h of x, which is the exponential generated function of uh, h of n times x to the n over n factorial is the product of 
f a of x, f b of x, f c of x, f z of x, which I have computed all of these individual terms. So let me try. Let me try to see what happens. Uh, f a and f b are e to the x minus e to the negative x. C e to the x plus e to the negative x over two over two, and the last one is e to the x squared. That's f c and f d are both e to the x. Okay, if I if I open the parentheses, I'm going to get e to the two x minus e to the negative two x over four times e to the two x. So this is one fourth times e to the four x minus one. And for that, I can quite literally compute the uh, just the just explicitly compute the generating function. Because uh, well, let's see what's going to be. It's uh, one fourth times the sum over n greater or equal to one, because I subtract one from here. Uh, e, e to the four x is it's like four to the n times x to the n over n factorial. I, I can even cancel out the four sum over n greater or equal greater or equal to one, four to the n minus one times x to the n over n factorial. So. The conclusion is that h of n is equal to 4 to the n minus 1, as in the, whoops, yeah, okay, I have the same computation here. Right, so h of 2 was equal to 4. In general, it's going to be just the power of 4. So, uh, an exercise try proving this combinatorially. Shouldn't it be 4 to the n minus 2 because h of x is a series for n greater than or equal to 0? Uh, well, actually, I mean, uh, h of n is the coefficient in the sum of x to the n over n factorial which is, uh, I, ca I cannot just shift n because there is, the, the, the degree of x is n, right? But it is, you are right that uh, h of n is 4 to the n minus 1 for n, for only for n greater than or equal to 1, and h of 0 is equal to 0. So that's the, that's the difference that this n greater than or equal to 1 makes. Does it make sense? Okay, thanks. All right, which is, I mean, this makes sense because if you look at the at the con, at the statement of the problem, there has to be an odd number of a's. So if you want to color zero zero people using an odd number of colors, you're going to fail. So yeah, the whole computation is consistent with the problem. And the yeah, but but I want to emphasize that the the conclusion is. An equality of two numbers. There is there is no generating functions in here, so that's one of the first examples where an actual combinatorial proof would be sort of tricky, I guess. And more examples are to come in the next lecture. So yeah, the, if you think this is impressive, they wait until the next lecture. There is going to be some pretty advanced stuff. Anyways, any questions? Any questions on? this stuff. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm out of time, so see you all on Friday, where the, the last homework before the midterm is due on Friday. And see you then. Thanks for coming to the lecture.